Okay, welcome to this flip lesson on waves and the wave model. In this first um, flip lesson, we're going to look at um, how we describe waves in physics um, using the wave model um, and all the different ways that all the different terms and the ways that we um, characterize waves. Um, then, in the following two flip lessons, we'll go on and look at two um, important types of waves: mechanical waves, which are ones that need a medium to travel through, and then electromagnetic waves, which is things like light. Um, and we'll look at some of the properties of those, some of the important examples of those, and um, some of the ways that they behave. Okay, let's get into it. Okay. So to start out with, as usual here, we have the key concepts from the subject outline from the SACE board and then our success criteria here in green. These dot points represent all the things that we need to be able to do. So what we're going to learn in this flip lesson is how to represent transverse waves graphically and analyse the graphs. Um, we're going to describe waves in terms of measuring quantities including amplitude, wavelength, frequency, period and velocity. Most of that will be on the next slide. And we're going to solve problems involving these two equations here. This one relates frequency and period, and this one um, we call the wave equation, relates the velocity, the frequency, and the wavelength. We'll talk all about that more in the next slide. But just to start out with, when we talk about a wave in physics, what is it? A wave, waves are periodic oscillations that transfer energy from one place to another without the transfer of matter. So if you think about when we talk to somebody, we don't have like little spit particles coming out of our mouth that transport out and hit you in the ear and that's how you hear. I know some people maybe seem like they talk like that. Um, or when we see light, um, we don't have, you know, the movement of matter from one place to another. And the same when we use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or radio and TV or our mobile phones. We are getting this transfer of energy or matter from one place to the other. With, sorry, we're getting the transfer of energy from one place to another without the transfer of matter. That's the key thing that really makes a wave. So start by talking about longitudinal waves. This here represents a tuning fork um, with something we would use in the lab with um, younger kids. And you tap the tuning fork and you hear it make a, a sound. And it's a good way to think about a sound wave because what happens is as that tuning fork goes out, it squeezes the air together and we get a compression, and then as it springs back, we get an area of lower pressure, which is a refaction. And basically, that propagates out through the air, this series of compressions and refractions. And then when those oscillations in the air particles um, reach our ear, they make our eardrum vibrate, and that gets transferred into um, the inner ear and, transfer and converted into a, a nerve signal that gets sent to our brain. But the key thing here is in this longitudinal wave, we have basically the particles vibrate backwards and forwards in the same direction as the direction the wave travels. So there's our direction of energy flow. Our particles are all going to vibrate back and forward in that same direction. In a transverse wave, and this is more maybe what you think about when you think about a wave on the ocean, on the water, but there is also other sorts of transverse waves. The particles all vibrate perpendicular to the way the energy flows. So the particles are all going up and down and the energy here would be flowing horizontally. So that would be what a transverse wave is. Um, so that key difference there, transverse wave, particles oscillate at 90 degrees to the direction of travel in a longitudinal wave they vibrate in the same direction as the energy is being transferred. We can actually show those um, really well using a slinky spring. Okay, this might be um, a little bit noisy, but we'll give it a try. Um, I have got a slinky spring here, and I'm going to try and demonstrate a longitudinal wave, and then I'll try and demonstrate a transverse wave. So as I said, in a longitudinal wave, the particles vibrate backwards and forwards in the same direction as the energy flow. So I can simulate this by basically sending a pulse through the slinky. Um, and 
and what you're seeing is that pulse or that compression traveling down, bouncing off the end and then traveling back. So that's what our um, longitudinal wave looks like. Okay, by contrast, a transverse wave, the particles oscillate at 90 degrees to the direction of the energy flow. So initially the energy is going to come down towards the camera there, um, but you're going to see the spring is, the parts of the spring are going perpendicular. So we'll show that like this. So there's a little bit of, um, sorry, I almost knocked my camera over, but that's okay. There's a little bit of um, both uh, longitudinal and transverse in this wave, but it's predominantly a transverse wave. And if we set up what we call a periodic oscillation, so it's repeating. It looks something like that, as opposed to our longitudinal wave that looks like that. So hopefully that sort of demonstrates longitudinal and transverse waves. I think if okay, so how do we represent um, a wave? Um, and the good thing is that we represent both a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave in the same way. And we represent both of them using this, what we call this sort of sinusoidal curve or this sine wave. Um, if you've ever um, done um, the sine function in mass, you might know a little bit about that. Um, if you basically plot an angle versus its sine, that's the sort of shape of the graph that you will get. Now, how does this work? Well, if we think about our longitudinal wave first, and we can think this is a compression, then a rarefaction and a compression, and these are traveling, say, to the right in space. When we represent that with a wave, um, we can think of almost this being like the pressure. So here at the compressor, the pressure is higher. Here in the rarefaction, the compressor is lower. Higher pressure, lower pressure. So this curve, in a sense, represents the pressure or the amount of particles in that space. You can also think about this being the displacement of how far they've travelled, but to me that gets a little bit more complex. So I think for everything we'll do, if you just think about representing the longitudinal wave um, as it, or thinking of it as areas of high pressure, compressions and low pressure, low pressure, refractions, and that basically graph is giving you a, an indication of whether we have a high pressure or a low pressure at that point. And we can see how that sort of represents that wave. If it's a transverse wave, it's almost a bit simpler because all we are doing is representing what is the sort of displacement of these particles from that sort of average in the middle. Um, so that sine wave, as you can see, fits over the position of those particles at any time. As they move, the energy is moving through this way, the particles are vibrating up and down. Um, and I think we can see how we easily represent that with that sine wave. So basically that sort of sinusoidal wave, um, that sine shape is the way that we represent a wave. Now let's talk about some of the terms that we commonly use to describe waves. And the first is frequency. The frequency of a wave, and we give that the symbol F, is the number of vibrations or cycles that are completed per second or the number of complete waves that pass a given point per second. Frequency is measured in hertz. HZ is the symbol we give that. So the number of waves is the frequency. When we talk about sound, we often talk about frequency. Um, our ears can detect sounds between 20 and 20,000 hertz, for example. And we'll do some, demo, um, some experiments with that in the lab classroom when we do some visits. Um, we talk about um, different notes in music, like uh, a middle C is 256 hertz. So, um, and we talk about pitch, and pitch is basically just another word for frequency when we're talking about sound waves. So, you know, a, a high pitch sound has a high frequency, lots of vibrations per second. A low pitch sound has a lower frequency, less vibrations per second. The next term we need to know is the period. The period, and we give that the symbol capital T, is the time interval from one vibration or cycle 
or is the time interval for one vibration or cycle to be completed? So how long does it take to go from one compression to the next compression? How long does it take for the particles to go, well, let's say start in the middle, to go down, back up, and come back to where they were? So that is basically related to the frequency and the formula that relates those two is frequency equals one over period or even if we rearrange that period equals one over frequency and if you think about that sometimes the formula is a bit confusing but if you think about if the time between waves was say um, a hundredth of a second so 0.01 seconds one divided by 0.01 or one divided by one on hundred would equal a hundred so you would have a frequency of a hundred so 0.01 seconds, hundredth of a second for each wave, there would be 100 seconds per wave. To go the other way, if you have a frequency, let's say in this case, of a frequency of 10 hertz, 1 divided by 10 would mean each wave takes 0.1 second. So the period would be 0.1 second. So there's that very, um, hopefully simple relationship there between the period and the frequency. Um, the next um, factor that we probably use most is the wavelength. We give that this, comes from the Greek alphabet, it's lambda, it's sort of their version of L, um, so hence length, wave, length, L, lambda, um, so it gets that sort of sideways T almost look, um, is, this, is the symbol. Um, and the wavelength of a continuous wave is the distance between successive points at the same displacement and moving in the same direction. That is the distance between points that are in phase. Okay, that might all seem a bit confusing, but basically the wavelength is the distance between where it's at the same displacement here and here, and it's heading in the same direction. So why is it not the wavelength just say from there to there? Because they're in the same position. Well, because in one of these, it would be moving up and then in the other one, it would be, well, hang on, we're coming down here. So this one here, it'll be moving back down. On this one here, it'll be heading back up again. Um, so, um, but I don't think, you know, if you just think about that, that point there and that point there would be wavelength. That point there and that point there. That point there and then that point there. Because in both cases, it's in the same position and it's heading down in the same direction. So that's our wavelength. Um, so I didn't talk about the period. The period here, if we were thinking about the displacement of a particle versus time, it's the time to get between two equivalent points is your period. The wavelength is the distance. If we think about distance on the x-axis now, it's the distance between two points. The final Quantity that we use, a little bit less common, but I mean, it is important to know. I know it comes up again next year in some contexts in physics, is the amplitude. We give that the symbol capital A. The amplitude of a wave is the value of the maximum displacement of a particle from its mean position. It can represent the height of a water wave. The intensity of light is represented by the amplitude or the volume of a sound wave. Now, probably with volume, we're thinking about the maximum pressure difference between the average and a rarefaction or a compression. If we are thinking about um, a wave on the water here, we are thinking about what is the maximum displacement from the, from the middle, like the water level is, if you like, there, and waves are going up and down. The amplitude is basically the height of the wave the height of the crests or the depth of, sorry, the height of the crest or the depth of the troughs. We'd use crest and trough there. So frequency, period, wavelength, and amplitude. Um, that's what we're, they refer to when we're referring to a wave. The other thing we need to know about is the wave equation. Now we've already learnt last, um, or learnt previously, that velocity is, strictly speaking, I should say displacement over time. I'm cheating a bit here, but we're using speed and velocity a little bit interchangeably here where we talk about sound. So distance over time. So if we think about a wave, what's the distance the wave travels for one oscillation? That is our wavelength. 
What is the time that takes is the period. So the velocity of a wave is equal to the wavelength divided by the period. But we also know that, well, let's rearrange this. So that is the same as saying the wavelength times 1 over the period. But we know that frequency is equal to 1 over t, 1 over period. So if we substitute that in, we get what we call the wave equation, which says the velocity of a wave is equal to the wavelength, lambda, times by the frequency, f. Very common formula that we're going to use um, over the next um, couple of years um, as we go through our physics journey. So, v is the speed of the wave in metres per second. Frequency, oops, f is the frequency of the wave in hertz, and lambda is the wavelength in metres. And that gives us our wave equation. So hopefully now, um, I'm just going to try and quickly go back to here. We can represent transverse waves graphically and analyse the graphs. I've also done longitudinal waves as well because I think it's important to do both. Um, and the graphs were on the next slide. We understand wavelength, frequency, period, and velocity, and I've thrown amplitude in there as an added bonus, and we understand where these two formulas come from. And now, hopefully, you'll be able to go away um, and answer some questions about those, and just in general, when people are talking about waves, understand what they're really talking about when they use terms like, particularly frequency, wavelength, um, velocity, and amplitude, which, which are terms that tend to get used um, a lot when we're talking about things like sound and electromagnetic waves like light.